guys for giving these kind of stuff away. Um, your presentations. Um, I'm fascinated with the struggle of humanity you know, to conquer outer space. I think this is something that we have managed to do. It's not like a, a small, small thing. In the expense of many other things, of course. I still don't know if we did it or it was a movie, but. My cousin is a movie. <laughs> <Yeah. Cool. laughs> Something um, we did. There is an image, but <laughs> what? <laughs> it's still under discussion. The setting. But quite like this, uh, it's kind of almost like a progression that I, I saw in this, uh, mm -hmm. this kind of presentation. Starting with, uh, with uh, Alexandra's um, alienation and a whole the invocation of habit, which is very much related to the activity of memory as well. It's how we can actually habitually do things by memorizing and by having different things on memory within, within us. Um, and then of course we, uh, we kind of uh, almost uh, jump from the human race to slime or some of these kind of uh, little non-human entities to do with uh, this um, presentation. But it was not only kind of non-human entities in terms of living organism or so, but it was actually satellites that actually had completely different necessary domain and therefore can be able to collect his amount of data and then process this kind of, uh, of data in computational terms. Um, and then to, to Ricardo's uh, kind of questioning and, and exploring the, the indigenous and myths, the, the generational legacy, as you know, call it, throughout the throughout history. Um, but in all of kind of these, all these cases, I had this kind of feeling that the, the alien memory, even in the satellite uh, is there. And it's precisely what um, I would like to, to consider, therefore to uh, trust to, uh, to our colleagues, uh, that deep cell in memory is not anymore the compression of the past within the present, but actually it operates within a futurity that is uh, immanent within this kind of uh, memory. And it's kind of, uh, even from, from the slime mode or the indigenous or or the, the way to break up their habits, it's almost this kind of anticipation, the preemption of something, the kind of participating to how memories are replayed, or our memories reconstructed, or how memories suddenly as this kind of alien, um, alien kind of um, um, alien element. Um, the question that, that I would like to open now to uh, uh, the three colleagues is what is this role of, of alien memory and alienation into your, into your work? Because I can, I can see the estrangement, the alienation, the breaking up of habits. It's almost like a consistent of breaking up of habits and, and therefore creating trade myths. It's almost like a consistent thing from the pre-industrial society to the estrangement of um, uh, of, um, of the beginning of the 20th century, and also to the aestheticized version of, uh, of, a, of a well thought kind of uh, system. And I think this is something that, that Claudia's kind of uh, macro work actually kind of contributed. That it is precisely the estrangement of the spatial forms, the alienation of the spatial form, that almost preempts and needs kind of uh, a new. Um, so how we mobilize this kind of uh, alienation nowadays? Mm -hmm. if, we, if we see some kind of positive thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I okay. can. Uh, I mean, during your, uh, your questioning, I thought about a lot of ways to address the points that you, you put it together. Um, I think it was I also agree, it was really great to see the work and um, everyone today and it does make me come back to what are my plans and what are that, that, I, that I want to carry on investigating which is um, I found some people recently that in terms of really sorry to be a, too academic but I found some authors and writers and thinkers that are really not mapped 
and I've been asking all my mentors, have you heard of them? Say, yeah, I heard, but it wasn't on my radar. I heard, but... And, uh, and all these guys have something in common, which is something I'm very scared of, and I do that very... My, my moment of alienation unnoticed because of the lecture uh, way, uh, but it's a, it's a Latin problem is what I do to do what I do, which is the positioning of addressing cultures which are not your culture, even being Brazil as a vast country, I'm not from the Amazon, uh, and the necessity to, to compare, the necessity to, to study and create platforms and I think there is a, my, my idea of there is a tendency to the, which I think has been hijacked now by, the, by what we've been seeing the last two years and the tendencies of Brexit in America about the blaming of the, the overall, you know, the large platform of a global system, which is fairly, of course, uh, with tons of problems. Uh, but I'm thinking of the, the authors that I mean, for example, Amos Rappaport, uh, Robert Redfield, um, uh, Roxana, Roxana, I forgot her surname. They are all in the threshold between our architecture and anthropology. And in the, in, from the 50s to the early, early 80s, they've been doing comparative studies. So they said, uh, Cultures are different, but we're not talking about cultures. We're talking about comparing lifestyles. People eat potato in different places. Uh, a culture of German eating potato and uh, people in South America eating potato is not just by post-colonial versus a Germanic, I don't know where potato comes from, but a Germanic uh, native vegetable, but it's more about a pattern of comparison. So there is the acceptance of how can we compare and make studies and I think this was very interesting because these authors, they came after the Second World War. They came after a world that was trying to come together after what happened in Europe and in the world. So all of them say the same thing. They say, we know that this is a big problem in trying to do what we do, but we're really looking at the, what are the problems and what are the possibilities of comparative they, and they come up with sub-agendas of it's not culture, it's lifestyle. And it's not lifestyle, it's the idea of living and what is the environment. So I think I'm very interested on, on exploring, knowing that in 2017, the, the lessons in history. But I find fascinating how in architecture, through a creative, positive uh, act of doing, like we've seen today, for example, Claudia's work, uh, there is, is sim you simply speculate and do it, and I think once you create something new, you, you're already repositioning those questions. I think if you get too heavily quotational, and that's what I, um, is my borderline, uh, so anyway, sorry, too long, but uh, it's more, I think, this question of how we can still look at the, at the large pattern without totalizing that pattern, but finding similarities, exchanges, uh, di uh, to create dynamic chromatism, in other words, bringing alienness, uh, seduction, difference to patterns which are already perhaps saturated by the exposure to tourism, etc. But talk too much, so. Yeah. Well, I was expecting this question, in fact, was my opening <laughs> sentence. I, bit, I can read it, maybe I can expand on that a little bit. So the opening sentence was saying that our work mobilized alien memory. So artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and being artificial intelligence to redescribe uh, an alien here intended as disconnected relationship between urban sphere and biosphere and, and natural and artificial and etc. But what do I mean with that? Uh, in a way, our work is interested on how you reintroduce pattern or process in society, or how through the whole industrial revolution, the product became the object we relate to. But we are unable to read pattern that are embedded on the product itself. Pattern of materiality, of production, of decaying, or flow, of energy, matter, and information. So we are unable to read this pattern. So how can, through different architectural systems that are not object anymore, but they are in sort of divenire, in your friend Pantarei, <laughs> Um, the, 
how can we uh, create a different language or a different uh, connection between multiple systems that is not about I take the object, I consume it and I dispose it. It's not a linear choice. I cannot, I don't need to choose A and B, but I have a redundant, a pattern amount of choice in front of me. And these choices are generated by the fact that the world that surrounds me is not about object anymore. It's about this multiplicity of information that could be biological or could be artificial. And they are a form of memory, but it's a, is a form of memory that is alien, so is inhuman, and allow, eventually, in my hypothesis, society to overcome the disconnection between systems that has been created um, by uh, the, the Industrial Revolution that doesn't ever. It's not guilty. It's just what happened. You know, there were reasons for that to happen, but there are reasons, I think, now embedded in society for that to be redescribed in terms of relationship. Okay. That is what it is. <laughs> okay. Well, again, my, my, let's say, my answer will be more uh, based on abstract concept theory rather than, let's say, giving uh, providing answers to formal answers. But I think what was uh, interesting and how I am trying to uh, reposition the work and the research I've done about alienation in modernism uh, and how to reposition it in con more contemporary context is a rather difficult one um, because I think in the early 20th century, uh, actually, the, 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 let's say the relationship between uh, what we call normal and what is alien or the other, it's a constantly uh, evolving one. So it is very difficult in uh, contemporary uh, culture where as uh, Claudia said, no, we're discussing about multiplicities of systems. How can then we uh, first uh, discern what is the normal and uh, how we can discern what is, an, norm, and normaliz what is normalization and then how can we define what is the alien against this uh, normal uh, condition. And I think that was most, I mean, it was easy. I, I bet, no, it was not easy, but now it's very easily discernible what happened in modernism, uh, with either with art practices or how easy it was for, for Marxist thinkers to identify, let's say, a normalization is, let's say, bourgeois or capitalist systems, and that would be, uh, that's the alien, and that's what we need to, let's say, attack. But I think this uh, analogy with uh, contemporary, um, and more complex systems, it's also kind of something that uh, paralyzes uh, even myself, how to start thinking about uh, uh, what we can call normal today. But, uh, it's not about uh, a disintegration of the normal, so you have a multiplicity of normal, you cannot have the normal, exactly. it's impossible. In the current society, you don't have the normal, you have a multiplicity of real that interact uh, with each other because the society is more diffused. So it cannot be judged accordingly to one single parameter. Okay, uh, I'll take this, this point now, and uh, it, it was already my last <laughs> question. It's okay, but because I mean, you, 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 you bring it back now, and I kind of uh, <laughs> like, uh, like um, Alexander's verb of uh, paralyzation, that actually the complexity, the multiplicity, has paralyzed us with actually forming a norm, or forming a, norm, a, a normative project. And, um, and I would like to kind of, um, of, of link this one with, with the reading of patterns. Uh, do we really read the patterns, or we apophenically speculate about what these patterns can actually tell us? And therefore, the normalization project can become a speculative project that we set up Okay, we, we, we should not refrain from the complexity of the world. Okay? But if we should actually mobilize a, a universal vision that can have almost this kind of uh, multiplicity as a, as a kind of a common ground, but one is being elevated, is becoming, is becoming a common vision for this, for this world. And the problems are known. Mm. It's not that they are not known. And, and for me, um, kind of let me read what Reza Nagarastani said like a couple of years ago. There is this kind of net circuit of false alternatives. 
right? Um, which is actually supplied under the rubric of liberal freedom, causes a terminal deficit of real alternatives. Establishing for thought and action the action that there is indeed no alternative. Right? So we have been immobilized by what actually we can we can say is a real alternative. And he has pointed out that this causes a fog of liberty that suffocates any universalist ambition and hinders the methodological collaboration required to define and achieve a common task for breaking out of the current planetary um, morals or, or the, the problems that we, we kind of face. And, and although understanding you know, the alienation of the bourgeois kind of uh, culture is that distinction with that, uh, or the, the computerization, digitalization that again might form another kind of uh, alienation, um, there is no within us and this kind of alien memory that can actually uh, all can be um, triggered by action and praxis. And through this kind of labor within within the world, labor within the uh, the material world around us, uh, can create new concepts, <coughs> new language, new norms that actually can have a, uni a, a universal uh, a universal ambition. What do you mean with universal ambition? Um, there are problems nowadays that can that, and this is another kind of point that we can uh, we can position. Uh, so there are problems nowadays that has to do with political, economic, ecological, and social problems um, that we still cannot find an alternative. And these problems are actually has a planetary scale, a problems in the planet, the planet. And the reaction to this is the nationalization of, of the problems. America just said, climate is not my problem, okay, I have other problems to solve. So it refrained, kind of refraining from, from the, the big problems of, uh, of, of our world into almost kind of um, uh, an, uh, an inquiry of the authentic selves and ideal society that oh, damn it, something went wrong and now we have to build America great again, or... My, my kind of... Um, my kind of worry or my kind of anxiety, and I can, I, I'm sure it's kind of... It's, it's, a, it's apparent here. And that's why I think this kind of, uh, this kind of event is... It's just, that just like the local interaction or the local, the local intervention enough if we, if we have to face problems of that scale. Well, there needs to be a recognition of a relevance of the local interaction. If not, uh, it, it cannot have an agency. There is no need, uh, I think, uh, for the definition of one norm that solved no, yes, a planetary but issue. No, but this is not uh, a norm to solve. This is very nice what Foucault says, right? The norms function is not to exclude and reject and therefore simplify problems that are to be able to, to solve it. Rather, it is always linked to a positive <coughs> technique of intervention and transformation, which is actually to, to create a norm, not to solve, but to reorient our effort or to create this kind of common, common task. You know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, and I perhaps pay a price for it, for loving experimentation. Mm -hmm. also, uh, and there is a book that I have in my library that really makes me very anxious. It's called Theory Plus Experimentation, published in the 90s. So everyone I loved as an, as a, as an architecture student was on that book. Uh, and they were talking about theory versus experimentation, the idea of organizing thought versus having an agency of ideas and creating and then debating over it. Uh, the spontaneity and the, the novelty that it brings. Um, and I think bringing the conversation more for, in my, my answer, perhaps bringing to uh, the act, the agency, the, the, to do what we do as architects, as teachers, uh, practitioners. I think there's something quite interesting about a certain uh, experimenting over the issues, a, a certain making 
uh, and by that perhaps I even call chromatism, the, a certain uh, freedom over the material in terms of, of course, knowing the boundaries when you're dealing with cultures, etc. Because I think of otherwise, uh, if we can get hooked on the, on the jargons of the debate itself, they are already established. You know? For example, if we all choose here, we can start talking about not problems of how to build that or react to, for example, complex issues. We can instead use ontology, epistemology, alienation. These words are ready and revealed by decades, you no, know, like centuries even, and they all have a big legacy. I think uh, the if we're talking about the, the the anxiety to change, the anxiety to create change, there's always a certain element of positive ignoring or a certain uh, notion of acting over the material, experimenting from creating things from. A proposing things, a certain audacity of a, a, a avant-garde, uh, that it has to have a certain autonomy, you know, and because the more that you think of the planetary scale, the more that you go through the institutional mechanisms, or you start playing God, you play, you start recreating the, as Fernando Pessoa said, you know, uh, uh, you start recreating the the whole institutions in your head and the whole thing. Uh, maybe the localism, my, my two cents here, maybe the localism has to do about uh, not necessarily going to communities and staying there one year making buildings and projects, but I think it's uh, in between negotiating that transition of scale, negotiating that transition of, of agency and technology and how this can be not just top-down, but create really kind of a... I never forgot what Vandana Shiva... Uh, f a physicist activist from India, she said that people don't want to bring new technologies to India, they want to bring just to use what we have here. But for example, villages that don't have water, they need a water pump, pump. they need a well in order to live. And you can teach them how to fabricate the parts, you can create a workshop here. They, they can be become a regional redevelopment of how to extract water from the ground and mitigate that. Uh, it was quite a quite refreshing uh, way of thinking of introduction of difference into places that are seen as archaic or more isolated. Okay. Yeah. No. I think I think picking up on on, on Claudia's and Marco kind of uh, 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 project. Um, what is really kind of. Uh, Interesting is precisely this uh, this platform that is being created of interaction as you call it. Um, but these, um, how do you see that these can be plugged in into platforms that actually can substitute or can reappropriate the technologies that we have nowadays and then have been used as, as Ricardo said. Facebook and, and Google, but actually we still have uh, technologies to actually create this kind of ambition that it is bigger than the local ambition of, of, uh, of let's say, uh, the solar side. How do you... You want to answer? The question for me. <laughs> oh, no, it's, uh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Um, well, uh, there is a question of, uh, um, I think, uh, um, trying to uh, redescribe uh, the current uh, cultural and technolo technological infrastructure. And uh, the way we approach that is uh, through entry point of uh, project but there is a need of reframing uh, and I'm still not sure under percent how this reframing could happen because I'm not for uh, total clearing of something and to be substituted in total by something else although more emergent and more uh, but that, that this wouldn't be embedded in the logic uh, but I uh, still think that in the way uh, 
politicians take decisions or in the way energy is produced or the way city or structure is still embedded in a paradigm of control and of creating of a sort of norm. So while I think this uh, should be um, in a way uh, discarded uh, to create a condition where there are multiple voices that can eventually be simulated, that could become the design tools, or rather than planning what exactly is happening, you simulate. And um, uh, usually is, uh, our entry point is uh, from uh, sites that have uh, peculiar characteristic of conflict between infrastructure and ecology and other means uh, prove not to function. So we don't need to discard in a system that is in place, uh, but uh, we need to propose an alternative solution. Though design-wise, that is our entry point. Then we managed to succeed at a certain scale. Then at a larger scale, I have to say, we, we still didn't manage to uh, bring the project to a level that I think is actualized enough to discuss what can be the next, uh, the next step. But uh, yeah, there is a problematic question of how you then scale up. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, hypothetically, we propose a different model. But I'm not up for, okay, this model doesn't work. <laughs> Let's uh, trash it and have mm -hmm. another one. That, that, that would be like a contradiction in term. <laughs> Because, uh, so, so that's, uh, that's a question that still needs to be developed, I think. Yeah. I think almost that, that, that idea of, just a quick note on that, I think a lot of times it has to do how things are received, no? And I think somehow, I think at least my generation or my studies, I never had enough input into, not theory, but perhaps some, some sort of in-depth understanding of how cognitive or perception equipments occur into in us, no? How we how do you receive the different? There are psychological studies in the sixties, seventies about how people are confronted with the different, with what is not familiar, the strange. Uh, and I think you, you can go through many methods about understanding how not you convince people to like, but how you, you do negotiate that boundary of of uh, either implementation or uh, the, the introduction of the alien body and the discussion of how this can unfold. For many years, I, I, was, talk, I was chasing that word encryption, decryption. I, I thought this was an amazing thing by trying to encrypt and decrypt knowledge uh, through some kind of environment, ornamentation, uh, but not of shields and things, but through how this could be encrypted on the form. And then sometimes you find uh, that it doesn't need to be so uh, a mechanism of encoding, uh, sorry, encrypting and decrypting. Sometimes it's about clues. Sometimes it's about giving clues. And I think architects do that all the time. Suggestiveness of form, suggestions of light, suggestions of material. I think the articulation, uh, the articulation of these two is so essential. No? Uh, and maybe that needs a collaboration of or simply our different sensibility from <coughs> our side, or maybe utilizing what we already have in a different type of architecture that we simply think like we want people to feel good in an area, and which kind of people will come here. I think there is some kind of very standard way of approaching architecture which can be quite useful on that as well. I think uh, just uh, another <laughs> very short note, but uh, stepping on this idea of clues, Usually clues are very contextual, and in that sense, they have uh, they they concern a very specific um, scale, which then highlights again your problem of how do we then transform this clue to a universal and give it a universal uh, validity, for example. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course, of course. I mean, I thought it was interesting this uh, this uh, element of. Uh, as uh, everyone has been talking about technology in this uh, in this three presentations, we can say, but um, there is no example I think uh, here of uh, uh, of how this uh, idea of technology really I think um, can be purposefully hijacked uh, into uh, into 
for this uh, kind of uh, moment. No, I think that one of the problems, um, and I think what the, the idea of localism may bring, is uh, really a kind of platform to, to almost like misuse uh, technology to a purpose that uh, is not what is being developed for. And I think, um, for instance, when we were working with uh, this satellite uh, mapping of the Salina, which we started to do simply because the territory was so vast that we wanted to, uh, to find a way to, to, to know about it more in detail, more in depth. And then we discovered, uh, we, we started this collaboration with ESA and, uh, and we started to understand a bit more about what, what, the, what they have and what we could use. And so we realized that basically uh, all their projects, so basically the development of the satellites, of the sensors, the maintenance, the algorithms for the processing of the data that the sensors send to the homes and the base stations and so on and so forth. All of these apparatus uh, has been developed with very specific purposes. Uh, in fact, uh, the, 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 the kind of oil industry and extraction industry is one of the main. And then uh, the environmental monitoring industry, which is in itself problematic, like we, we were saying. So. It's, it's, it's another one. Also, the producing these images of a, you know possible catastrophe or, or, or accelerated change, etc., etc. No? So, in itself, the, uh, the, the, the one of the first moments of the project was uh, really to, to say, oh, maybe uh, Solana, you know, this is kind of a very uh, you know beautiful, but at the same time uh, pretty uh, kind of. Uh, an impressive uh, kind of location uh, could be used to, to begin to repurpose uh, uh, this uh, technological apparatus with, uh, with its algorithms and so on to, to something else. And something else that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, emerges from this very peculiar local condition, uh, but it in itself it's also prototypical of, of another way of approaching uh, you know, the, what, what is the sort of conflictual relationship find in many other places. So, you know, the idea of uh, like local people thinking about the Salina as uh, this uh, uh, beautiful place uh, where they used to work, and mm -hmm. even if the work probably was uh, horrendously hard, and you know, imagine like uh, people were you know by hand, uh, you know, extracting salt in 40 degree sun, uh, you know, in the Mediterranean, putting on conveyor belt, conveyor belt, you know. But they have this kind of memory of this uh, beautiful past, and, and, and now they have substituted it with this ideology of uh, the Salina as a perfect uh, ecosystem which hosts these migrating birds, and, 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 and you know, all of a sudden you can't touch it because otherwise uh, you are destroying it is a perfect ecosystem of the birds. So, it, it is, uh, you know, in that sense, we, we I, I found it quite interesting how uh, a peculiar, specific local condition, which in itself is not particularly special, uh, can on one side be used to, to begin to repurpose uh, technological apparatuses that, that have uh, a kind of, a, uh, let's say, a problem at their core in the, because of the way they were uh, conceived and the purpose they were conceived. And on the other hand, also try to uh, you know, question uh, um, ideological positions that you find almost everywhere when you go into these local realities. Try just to offer a, a kind of practical solution, you never get to the end of it because then the practic any practical solutions never uh, manages to, to, to escape these uh, these are kind of uh, uh, traps, these uh, yeah. ideological traps. Yeah. So, and I think that connects to what you were asking before about the question of the global relevance and the local interaction. For me, it's not simply a question that needs to be all about local interaction. System can interact locally and globally, but system interact and don't try to achieve a perfect static solution, which is the paradigm in which uh, the contemporary society still lives and which and one of the problems that architecture is facing, like uh, many of the politicians we present our project to, uh, would uh, uh, regard it as probably utopic, while in my opinion, it's actually less utopic than conceiving the Salina as a perfect ecology, because that is completely utopic. That is an easy to understand image, is a norm that we can visualize, but that is an impossibility 
because that doesn't exist. If you leave the Salina like that, I have the picture on my phone I did a show in the presentation. You have this beautiful cracking pattern, which I love aesthetically, but it's not a Salina anymore. It's a desert with cracking pattern. So um, the question is, how do you make a shift before the infrastructure? How can you make a shift in culture where staying with the problem, as you say, sometimes uh, becomes the norm, maybe. <laughs> the norm is not about finding the geometrical norm, but is a behavioral norm. It becomes about, you know, accepting the fact that reality is actually dynamic and solutions that we propose are a multiplicity and deal with this failure and reconstruction. They are not about finding a perfect solution. You know, there's, a, there's something interesting, uh, because I think in, I, I'm very suspicious of localism as well. I, I travel to a lot of places, I have the, the chance to visit a lot of, and I think there's always that tendency of survivalism, the architect's role of delivering, which I think is noble and necessary to have people that do that, you know, for building schools and uh, really acting on the front line of necessity in places. But discussing another type of role that architects can have where that the localist doesn't become kind of the, the new noble savage. You know, the new kind of noble savage of, look, let's help. Because that's a noble thing to do. Uh, that's what cultural relativists bring. Cultural relativists bring that every culture is important. But by the same thought, every culture is irrelevant. Because there's no measuring, uh, not <coughs> of, of, of magnitude, but of degree. Uh, so, for example, if you think of cities as the, as the beginning of stock, you know, nomads, perhaps a bit of fruit collecting, agriculture, there's the stocking and then the institutions, the priesthood, the organizations, they come, the institutions that maintain that settlement alive from pre-civilization to civilization, where things grow, get more lax, more low. Uh, and I think the, then it's not about the return for the pre-civilization where there was no lex, that there was no institution, but I think today even more with our exposure of thinking of the other guys behind the Facebook screen of our preference, I think do generate a different, what we call phantoms, this sort of cognitive noise that, that generate our primal emotions towards the dissolution of this civilization or, so I think it's less about localism or, or, or global. I think there's perhaps there is a there is a concept of how do you visualize the constant dissolution and, and, and solidification of patterns which are appearing uh, through projects, through conversations like this, uh, because otherwise the, the own terms that we use they create the deadlock for us. You know, they create the deadlock of thinking. So I think that idea of the stabilization of institutions that we have today, schools for example, I think they tend to, uh, we, we, we miss those things when they disappear, it's part of most of us in terms of culture upbringing. So I think that there's something about uh, the, 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 the idea of the constant pulsation of movements, of how you can create projects which sometimes are also bad word, difficult word, but perhaps educating, they are bringing a certain condition of learning and dissipation of the ideas from new old practice, I'm not sure, but... Uh, also because the idea of uh, transmitting an information is as well not linear as, as in terms of education, as any other transmission of information is not linear, but is mm. a multiplicity of event. Mm. So the question is, no, I cannot actually I cannot teach you something, it's impossible. I can have a conversation with you, but I cannot teach you mm -hmm. something because you will perceive it through your own filter and you will send something back. So the idea of teaching, it's almost, uh, even Experience. with the student, is al almost uh, doesn't exist. It's about developing a conversation mm. and through a conversation, developing a new entity of knowledge of food or whatever, but mm. <laughs> you develop a new entity which is a mix of mm. know-how. It's my know-how with your know-how and uh, 
embedded in the milieu in which we are embedded. So that uh, creates uh, a sort of knowledge which is unique of that type of condition. But I think there needs to be an awareness that emerges that I'm not me that I teach you. It's a form no, of tra yeah. trading of multiple level. And how the more this trading is described, and I think the more awareness we have of this, the more y you can get more specific. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have any more the generic big entity on one side and then the generic or the savior as well, isn't it? Yeah, the, the savior on one side and the other on the other, the, at the end are homogeneous, mm -hmm. but they are not. Uh, each entity ha has its own characteristic. And therefore, you know, is a question of exchange mm. between these these characteristics. In, in this conversation, you should also include the, the growing portfolio no, of the student or the project as such. I think in a school like AA or, or BAT, uh, this is kind of experimental condition. I think the growing project or the growing post portfolio becomes an entity in itself. And I think, uh, uh, I know you, you and your method very well, and to some extent, Claudia, etc. Uh, there is a, always, a, I think, a, a, an interest in, in kind of having this medium uh, as, a, a, as part of the conversation. No? Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember very clearly also uh, having two or three conversations with the students without something being produced or something growing as a result, uh, it becomes a difficult and, and, uh, and frustrating. So I think that, I don't know if the portfolio can be considered a form of alien memory also in itself, but uh, to a certain extent, uh, you know, it, it is a, a build up of, of this conversation that at some point takes a life of its own and begins to steer the conversation mm -hmm. in other directions. And so it's, it's another, no, uh, uh, entity in, in this, uh, in this. And I think that's, that's a, for me is a, in my case, but I think also in your case, uh, the, our projects uh, have a similar uh, role. They, we, we try to grow them also in conversation with, uh, with, with the clients and with the, the locations and with the technological devices. And, and, and then as the project begins to grow and develop, it actually becomes another uh, uh, sort of entity which steers the, the conversation and, and, and we sort of purpose, purposefully deployed in this way and, and, and uh, so yeah I, I think that's for me it's, it's, it's a quite an interesting element of what you're saying and, and this, maybe this idea of any memory actually becomes quite deeper also exactly I also think that the, the word teaching a kind of um, has some dangers especially uh, if we translate into more patrona let's say if we infuse it with patronizing dimensions, but instead I would say that making aware uh, of, uh, let's say, this pro uh, project of cognition and going back to your Montenegro, uh, mm -hmm. to the Salina project, no? making aware that, let's say, this idea of the memory of this landscape as something ideal was a construct, is a completely constructed one, mm -hmm. or, the, or the habit of uh, visualizing this, uh, uh, let's say, the, this, the landscape of the Salina as something that was something beautiful and uh, so it's a completely constructed one. So the point is actually to, to make them aware that this is not uh, the case and try to convince them rather than teach. And sometimes this, this learning happens through collisions, through disagreements, yeah. through this confrontation. And I think that's very important that I think come, come across the, the education it always happens as, and I think actually even in Italian, con, 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 conoscere, it comes from conoscere, which is kind of called being born again somehow. Uh, this idea of the knowledge is this kind of dual uh, rebirth of the reader and the, the text itself. But I think no one here is advocating for a specificity on text. And I think what these schools like the A and the Bartlett do very well is rather than to make the textbook ex strict, he actually looks at the library where you have several different types of units, several different types of knowledge, and they interchange. You can go to different shelves uh, because the textbook, although it's still around as, a, as an idea, and our practice sometimes, not my practice, but our all everyone's practice still somehow lingering on that 
if she wants to teach certain things to students. Uh, but I think this model, instead of the textbook, the library is a lot more interesting. And that's sort of a bit in the, going through the beaten path. Everyone will agree with that somehow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking before about because I think it's interesting. It's a question that I've also been thinking about myself. You know, this you mentioned uh, Trump uh, leaving Paris again, etc. So now there is obviously a rush uh, of uh, you know scientific community, etc., et that to try to explain to you yeah. know that global warming is real, is a problem, etc. No, and and so I, I read a few. Comments of people like in, in my Facebook bubble that swear that uh, that um, uh, you know were, were kind of struggling with, with this idea of how do we explain to people that it's an important problem, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe part of the problem itself. You know, uh, this idea that to, that we need to explain uh, that science already knows that the global warming is a problem and it's identified as such, etc. And now the real problem is to explain, you know, to educate people about this problem. I, I, I wonder whether maybe uh, these ideas <coughs> of elementary we discussed today, the way we discuss it, um, could also help reframing you know, this, uh, this question and, and maybe also see how architects or, or you know, artists uh, may uh, actually have a role uh, to, to play in this. You know? That is, uh, again, not just simply to build technical solutions to fight climate change uh, on the ground, but, but really to build, uh, uh, let's say, cognitive models to understand, to, to, to collectively understand what global warming is as such, and, and which in a way science is, uh, is doing with its own tools, but it's actually, I think, failing in, in terms of building a kind of a you know, shared platform of knowledge for I think that's that's. I mean, I don't have an answer, but I, I thought maybe this is uh, something that we could. Uh, I, I mean, I'm picking up to that to that point. I think uh, we can open the discussion to to all of you. Is the, is what you what you actually what you actually suggest is that we have done the experiments, we have speculating with all different uh, sort of platforms, but now is precisely the time to make this kind of cognitive model. It's actually to make something cognitive, so you have to somehow normalize it within an institutional kind of uh, kind of term. And I know that I'm using terms that are very heavily connotated with the bad kind of memories of all this kind of institutionalization and the normalization. But I think, and this is kind of something that, that has been shown so far, you know, but the time that the world has, has been expanded and more the industrial world and the, and the modern in the modern world and the, the idea of the kind of the enlightenment, all these kind of institutions and normalization have been used in colonial uh, policies and patriarchy in, 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 in trying to encapsulate you know, the world in, in cages. Uh, but precisely what, what kind of uh, we can suggest with kind of different new patterns, new cognitive models, is precisely that the normal now is becoming more of a reorientational tool something that we can aspire to, something that can actually give us an ambition. And that's why, for me, I see this kind of, not the universal domination, but the universal ambition as a, as a contradicting the local kind of uh, intervention to, um, or the locality, or the locality in search for some kind of, uh, um, as I say here, authenticity or originality. But then there, are second, uh, there is a second scale of localities that they can, uh, for example, going back to the Trump, uh, like this, mm -hmm. the very same day that uh, um, Trump withdrew from the Paris Agreement, the mayor of Cincinnati, the mayor of New York, and everybody else, you know, yeah, which yeah. were even more localized, uh, let's say, groups, mm -hmm. uh, that somehow it's not necessarily so, I would say, black and white lo locality versus universality. I think this is a quite not wrong distinction, but um, it, it creates also yes, a problem exactly. because it becomes a, a, a distinction yeah. or a decision. At the same time, many time mayors respond differently because they are dealing with communities that are di 
directly affected by the consequences. And so, I mean, that's, that's okay, but at the same time, that kind of brings you back to the same problem of, like, uh, you know, let's say, these uh, global policies which are, let's say, pushed by and then supported by science and by scientific understanding of the global problem versus uh, kind of local groups that are suffering the consequences of inaction. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is how do we break this uh, kind of situation and perhaps uh, create projects uh, as, as architects uh, that offer a better platform for global, let's say, agreement compared to the current one offered by science that it's not working, or it's not sufficient, or it's not, a, a, let's say, a collectively understood uh, and embraced, uh, and it doesn't enable uh, this uh, collective action or response or interaction, like we were saying. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, for me, it's something that I see when I see you going in, in, in Borneo or whatever. I see maybe that there is a, the beginning of a project of an artistic or, or architectural, I don't know what, <laughs> project there that actually can have and should have maybe the ambition to, in a way, substitute or complement the kind of scientific project of studying global warming to promote a kind of new global collective understanding. And, and, and I, you know, I think that's... that's I don't know, my kind of vision in that sense. I, 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 in, in, I, don't know, I think often maybe that, that, that ambition uh, in, in, in the way we talk as, as, as architects or academics is not uh, uh, clear enough or maybe we are not uh, uh, throwing it with enough conviction. And, and, but I think there is a really important level there that, uh, that architects should embrace and, and, and go there and claim. I think also to... to I mean, everything today sounds, sometimes I, I could even start saying, look, my name is Ricardo, uh, because today everything's so heavy loaded, you know, uh, the pronunciation is not that, but I pronounce it in English here. I think things are so heavy for a good reason, no? I mean, we learn from history, and I think, I think that uh, the, a certain autonomy of this artistic spirit of creating elements, no, I think is, is uh, hijacking a little bit what you said, is so important, because I think this also brings it puts the wheel moving. I never forgot when I watched that film, uh, Eclipse of a, I think called Eclipse of a Heart. I know that that's a song as well, <laughs> by, by Hambo, and he was he was with Verlaine and having dinner, and he got in this poets, everyone reading beautiful books, and he was a young uh, Leonardo DiCaprio playing this film, and then he stepped up on the on the dinner table where people reading poems and dressing extremely elegant and he's open his trousers and start pissing on the table and 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 reciting his poem as a performance and the shock of the institution of, about that young no one talking to the heavily uh, literate uh, intelligentsia of paris receiving that piece in the plate um, but I, I think, apart from the example, there's something quite interesting about, I think when teaching as well, because I see so many students here, there's something of the autonomy that the, the, the project that we have is not a textbook, that you give a certain autonomy to the students, that perhaps the path is known, but the result is through, the, through that conversation via the student, the result is very, very different. And that's what I think also can have a parallel with going to places like you quoted, and uh, and not dreaming the same dream, and the dream perhaps not even to be implemented as a one-to-one, -one, but a slice of it from images to animations to installation to parts of the building becomes a a, a, a provocation, becomes not an answer to answer uh, uh, an architecture to answer all the queries and all the politically correct moments, but becomes a way that you have to have a thick skin to receive the feedback, but that also helps to bring the wheel forward or the discussion forward. And sometimes if you overthink, you don't have it. If you overthink, you're not young anymore. I think there's that element of, that is very hard to bring on students that you want them to learn. At the same time, you want them to keep that autonomy necessary to challenge you and to bring something new. That's what I mean by 
perhaps chromatism or bringing things to a new stage as well. That's what I, I truly think experimentation and creation is also a way of a different place to, to push that conversation forward. Someone to, from the audience? Come on, this should be like a... <laughs> we a don't let them talk. <laughs> One of the important things that has been mentioned has been this idea of reframing. And I think probably in academia, the most important thing uh, that we do is reframing, because otherwise uh, there's very little point in what we do. Mm. And also, I think this reframing then has to lead, feed into practice. Mm. And I think that is the key, probably. Um, Going back to the idea of uh, alienation, to the concept, the issue of alienation, um, I know there are lots of different um, definitions of it and lots of different approaches to it. To it. Uh, we've had conversations with Manos. I know it is possible to look at it as a positive. Uh, personally, I look at it as a negative. Mm. Um, but the um, Dealing with the issue of alienation, if we recognize it, let me say it this way, if we recognize it, then what do we do about it? And it seems to me that there, we're always running a risk of stating the problem, if we do directly, or maybe we do it ambiguously. And then, because we aestheticize, the problem, we don't really lead to a solution, to a way forward. And I think that that becomes a risk. We become self-referential, and self-referentiality, I think, brings a sort of um, pointlessness you know, with it. it. We become ineffective, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. There is a risk, I'm not saying, yes, that, yes, that, yes. that it's you know, presented here. But, but there is a risk. And because of that, I think the invitation that Manus makes about finding this language that um, a new normative um, can be the goal. I think it helps if uh, we direct our efforts towards finding a, a way forward, a new language, a um, reframing. Uh, that uh, can lead into practice as well, can make a difference in practice as well. And just one other point, in the conversation, the idea of universal that you mentioned then got uh, translated into uh, globalization and localism. Uh, I don't think it has to be. I think you can see the universal within the human being as well. I don't think universal has to be seen as globalized mm -hmm. and as opposed to localized. But we can find global, uh, universalism within the human nature. And in human nature, I see the other beings as well, animals as well. And I think we've come to a stage where we have to feel a sort of show that we see our responsibility towards the earth and towards other um, Beings as well, and to proceed with them with that sense of responsibility in a way. Mm -hmm. There is any kind mm -hmm. of um, response or another kind of point? I would uh, I would kind of agree that universalism cannot be equated with, with globalism, and maybe that's kind of Alexander's point as well. Maybe this kind of global, local is almost like a bad distinction and maybe it's the ambition that can be found kind of um, um, even if the in the miniature level of the local human being or or the local interaction with uh, even if this is a slime or, or a technological apparatus or yes it's different global and local from local interaction because the local interaction that you mentioned and that I was referring to is not the local interaction between 
human being. It's not local. It's local interaction between entity locally. Yeah. And you were asking whether simply through local interaction is it uh, possible to have a sort of universal respond. And what I was saying is that uh, even in natural system, it's not only about local interaction. There could be uh, m multiple scale of interaction. The question is not the scale, but the approach. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, any more questions? We have already exceeded the time, so it's uh, already put a fast by. We hope we have uh, alienated you enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and this is like one part of the project. It's uh, precisely to break the habits, the automated responses, the, the normal that we have um, given to us. But I think the other part of the project is to construct new ways of looking, new cognitive models. New cognitive model models come from Frederick uh, James on this is actually not really kind of. But you know, like, uh, kind of universal ambitions precisely to collaborate among a, a, a common kind of uh, a goal and a common task. And, uh, and I think in this, in this kind of exploration or this kind of process of alienation, um, nothing can be left uh, aside like technology, indigenous or, or uh, living entities can actually participate with their own look, with their own version of, of, um, of working uh, the world we have uh, in front of us. Um, so be alienated, but come back refreshed, I would uh, <laughs> suggest. Okay, uh, we would like to thank you very much, uh, our three guests, for. <laughs>